Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the reasons why you will find me sometimes doing things that may not be my hobbies, but in order to either mess with the algorithm on social media, we will do certain things, or in order to attract the attention of those we are trying to deliver a greater message to, we will do certain things. Bearing in mind it takes you two seconds to do something, but because it is or we're living in this digital age, one video will make it seem like you did that for the whole life. When it was only three seconds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So it's a strategy, it's a way, it's a method. And I know we're talking about business today. I want to tell you I was so happy and proud to listen one by one to the, the panelists as well as the speakers, all of them speaking about our connection with Allah, our responsibility, morality, ethics, our duties, and so on, the focus on the hereafter, destination, Jannah, and so on and so forth. That is something I was expecting to hear and I heard it. So Alhamdulillah. However, I would like to add that every one of us needs money. We cannot say because I'm a pious person, that's it, I will live a life with no money. You need something, you need to survive. You need to actually earn. And this is why Allah Almighty has made it compulsory upon you to go and earn a living. You need to make sure you are doing something to earn so that you can fulfill the basics for yourself and those who are dependent upon you and thereafter engage in one of the pillars of Islam. Had you not had the wealth, you were not going to be able to engage in more than one of the pillars of Islam. Which are the two pillars that are connected to money? Zakat and Hajj. Hajj man istata'a ilayhi sabilan. Whoever can afford it. That doesn't mean you must sit back and relax. It means if you are making an effort to do some form of business in order to be able to afford the Hajj, you get a double, triple, quadruple reward for that business because your underlying intention is far beyond what is the basic requirement of a Muslim. Similarly, if I am earning in order to be able to be charitable, wallahi, I get a reward beyond my imagination. Imagine if someone says, look, I am earning, I am doing business and so on. And why are you doing business? And they tell you the true reason is I want to empower others. How much are you going to have in your life? A million, a billion, a trillion. What else? Beyond that, are you not going to build your hereafter? I want to show you something amazing. In our quest for wealth, and in our quest to earn in order to be able to lead a comfortable life, which is a good thing. To seek a halal livelihood is a duty over and above the other duties that Allah has placed upon you, such as your salah and so on. So while we want good things and we are going to work hard towards achieving so that we can have those good things, let me explain. Each one of us has a fear. What is the fear? I might lose the deal. What is the fear? I might lose my wealth. Or the fear of the bulk who are still up and coming is I may never make it. Look at this one. They made a million. They made 10 million. They made 100 million. Where am I? I am yet to see my first million. It happens. What is that? That is fear. How can a believer fear when, when Razak is Allah who made you? The sustainer is Allah. The Prophet Muhammad says, No soul will taste death until every penny, every portion, every portion of the sustenance written for it is given to it. You can't die. If there is one grain of rice remaining that was supposed to go in your mouth, death will only come after that one grain of rice is gone where it was supposed to. So trust Allah. While we lay our trust in Allah, let it not be tawakul and let it make, make sure that it is tawakul. What is the difference? Tawakul is the person who does al-akhdu bil asbab. The one who makes sure he does whatever is in his capacity, God-given capacity to achieve what he wants, then he relies on Allah. So tawakul means to do whatever you can. Seeking the help of Allah, using the ability given to you by Allah to achieve what you believe is good for you and beneficial for you. And then you lay your trust in Allah. That is called tawakkul. Tawakkul means 
to lay a false trust in Allah where you did nothing, yet Allah gave you the ability. I'm sitting in the masjid making dua, oh Allah, give me a good job, give me a good job. I'm there for Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and Tahajjud. And I never ever went out to look for any job whatsoever. That is tawakul. Tawakul meaning you are praying. Allah says, I gave you hands, I gave you feet, I gave you health, I gave you the ability. All you needed to do was to apply a little bit of the brain that we gave you to get up and to go and talk to a few people, open your mouth, network, develop contacts, go and ask, go and create a CV of yours, put it, present it, try again and again, and then you get your job. So tawakul is when you have done nothing and you expect Allah to do everything. And tawakul is... When you expect Allah obviously to help you and assist you and you do your best in your, with your God-given capacity, bearing in mind that whatever you get, you will still get it only because Allah will give it to you. So while we want to earn, we have a sense of fear. Where is that fear coming from? Wallahi, it is coming from shaitan. Ash-shaytanu ya'idukum al-faqra wa ya'murukum Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Shaitan promises you or he makes you worried about what? About faqr. Faqr means poverty. Shaitan is dangling the poverty in front of you. And what does he want you to do? He wants you to not only to consider unethical dealings or that which is unacceptable, but immorality as well. al fahsha that which is unethical, that which is immoral. We're talking about morality and business. Here the term used is fahsha. Fuhush refers to immoral behavior, which, which would include illicit relationships and so on. But it also refers to anything that lacks morality, is fahsha. A shaitan, what does he do? He promises you something false. He says, you know what? If you don't do what everyone is doing, you are not going to get the deal. How much did we hear this morning of so many of the entrepreneurs and the business people who were one by one saying, we left a deal for Allah, Allah gave us a bigger deal. Allahu Akbar. We left a deal for Allah, Allah gave us a bigger deal. And then there, was, there were others who spoke about blessings. In Islam, we are taught that what is more important is the blessing. It is more important than the figure, than the deal. I'd rather have less with blessing than to have more without blessing. But as a human, there is nothing wrong in asking Allah for both. You can be greedy, it's okay. For as long as your intention is, I'm going to be charitable, I'm going to be humble. Listen to the verse that I read earlier. الشيطان يعيدكم الفقر ويأمركم بالفحشاء وَاللَّهُ يَعِدُكُمْ مَغْفِرَةً مِّنْهُ وَفَضْلًا Amazing, amazing verse. Shaitan promises you that, you know what, you won't do the deal unless you do something wrong. So if you don't start doing wrong deals like what we heard about 9 liters of fuel being sold as 10 liters and so on, we heard those examples this morning. Shaitan tells you, if you're not going to do that, how will you break even? How will you make money? And Allah says, that is Shaitan's promise. He's ordering you to do something immoral and unethical. And Allah says, my promise is we will forgive you and give you more than you need. Fadl, that which is over and above what is needed. Allah says, we'll give you more than you need. Wallahi, my brothers, my sisters, today we are seated here. 100% of us, we have more than we need. If Allah caters for the ants that you cannot see, if Allah caters for the creatures that you cannot see, do you think he's going to miss me and you? You and I. Do you think we are going to be missed? Allah says he will never miss you. وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا Anything that moves on earth, Allah takes an oath that he is going to provide for it. It is Allah who will give. So now we are sitting and saying, but oh Allah, you didn't give me. <laughs> you want 10 million. We didn't say the figure. We just said we will provide for you your basics. What are your basics? Your food, clothing, accommodation. Don't you have it? If you want to go out and eat worth $500 every day, whose fault is it? 
Is it Allah's fault or yours? Whereas there are others who are eating for 50 cents a day or less. And there is barakah when we share things. When you cook for one person, you, it is costly. But when 20 people are eating together, what happens? It averages out. Far less. And guess what? I want to tell you something else. We spoke about Jolof so many times and people started fighting with me. When I was in Ghana, they asked me, favorite food. I said, my brother, don't put me in a corner. Yesterday, I met the volunteers. They said, we, each one of us said our name and favorite food. I said, are you, are you hinting at Jolof? But the point I want to raise, do you know, Wallahi al-Azim, I've taken an oath because it's my experience. From my experience, when you want your food to be tastier, it needs to be in a larger quantity. Have you ever thought of that? You cook a small amount, it's not going to taste as nice as it tastes when there's a big pot. Am I right or wrong? Let's talk of jollof. So now I can change it and say the best jollof is that which is cooked in the biggest pot. Allahu Akbar. In the fire outside, when that little scent of the nice burning wood comes slightly into that rice, then you call it jollof. Now you know. May Allah bless you. Why am I saying this? Because it's an example of baraka. Baraka comes when you care for everyone. I eat myself, you are not going to get that scent which you need. When you cook together, when, they, when there are weddings, go to the jollof there and see how it tastes. It tastes different from when it is cooked for one person. The same applies when you are worried about yourself, yourself, and just me and my earnings. Wallahi, I tell you, you might have and you will get because it's your sustenance. The minute you include others, Allah needs to give you to give them. If you have promised, I'm pledging for these orphans a million, Allah needs to give you that million because it was written for the orphans and it had to come through you. We don't understand that you need to be a Muslim and a mu'min and a firm believer in Allah to understand that. That is Allah. Every time Allah speaks about tijara in the Quran, it's never about worldly business. Tijara means business, isn't it? Allah says, Hal adunnukum ala tijara. Should I show you a business? That's what Allah says in the Quran. We're talking about business, isn't it? Let's look at the Quran. Where is the word used? It's used, Hal adunnukum ala tijara. Should I teach you or should I tell you about business? That's number one. Number two is, Yarjuna tijara Tabur. Allah mentions certain qualities and he says those people they are engaged in a business that will never fail what business imagine I want to know what business is it Allah is saying a business well you know what is that business it's a deal who wants the deal who is ready for the deal mentioned in the Quran wallahi it is a deal you strike with Allah Allah says you want to strike a deal come strike a deal with me about what about Jannah. You want to build it here? Let me show you. Come, let's do business. You do, I do. You try, I will give you. You try, I will give you. Because we are human. Our salah and our charities and all of that sometimes in intention and quality, it is lacking. Allah says, I will give you. Don't worry. You just do and try and keep going and humble yourself and correct yourself and seek forgiveness every time you falter because I created you a human being. I didn't expect perfection from you. I only expected a trial. Did you try? Yes, I did. Were you humble? Yes, I was. Did you reach out to others? Yes, I did. Did you believe in the last day? Did you believe in the prophets, the angels? Did you worship me alone? Yes, I did. Well, here is Jannah for you. These are the, these are the real deals. Because while I am earning in this world, and I'll give you another example as well, I might die before I see the fruits of an investment I have made. But in the eyes of Allah, your investments you've made, they will never die. In fact, if you die, you actually see the returns of it. There we go. Imagine someone promises you, listen, here's a deal. It will mature in two, two months. We are going to turn it around. We're talking of halal, obviously, right? And before that, you have passed away. What happens to all of that money? What happens to everything? Either they might cheat, steal, or if they were upright, they might give it to your family and they may fight over it, especially if the amounts are large. May Allah Almighty grant us all goodness and success. So that deal is not as confirmed as the deal with Allah. Allah says, Lan tabur. you can never go wrong with us. Never. Let's deal with Allah. So if you look at the verses, Allah speaks about riba. 
riba is usually an interest which you and I know as Muslims, بالضرورة. we know it necessarily that is haram. Now, haram and there is a lot of detail because sometimes we are living in an environment where there is no way out of certain things. So how to get it out of your system, that also is a contemporary discussion of the scholars. And they will tell you, look, if it happens to come and you happen to have had a deal where X, Y and Z has happened, you need to do A, B and C in order to get yourself out of this. That is a discussion on its own. But let's go to the verse. Let's look at what Allah says about riba. Allah says it clearly. If you are true believers, then fear Allah and quit the interest, the usury, the riba. Don't involve in it. Stop it. That's what Allah says. And what does Allah say? Now, remember, riba, what is riba? I'm investing. I want back something, but it's an unethical, immoral deal. That's riba. Allah tells you in the same verse where he says yamhaqullahu riba immediately after that he says wa yurbi wa yurbi yamhaqullahu riba means Allah will extinguish Allah will cause to be destroyed that which is filled with usury it cannot come with blessings and it will not last long and it will bring about problems and issues in your life and it will bring about negativity and so on and we will cancel it delete it deplete it and you are left almost suicidal in a lot of cases. You know of people who in other countries where they don't even believe in all of this and they just do as they please. Many times they tend to purchase something which they will have to be paying back for the next 30 years without having thought that next year I might lose my job and it's only been one year since the beginning of the payment. Yet I had a brilliant job. What happened during COVID, so many people lost their jobs. If you look at the amount of suicides of people living in Western countries simply because they lost the job, they lost the things, they lost their houses, they lost their cars, they lost their furniture, they lost their accessories, they lost everything. Their whole life was sitting on credit, the whole life. That's why I love to come to Africa. When I tell people, you see that car, you see those cars, they own them. You know what that means? When you go to the Western world, you see a car, they don't own it. They're just paying slowly. Come to Africa, the bulk of it, I'm talking about my own country in Zimbabwe. You see the cars on the road, they own them. What that means is we are not paying monthly, these are our cars. We are living happily than those who are paying for a fancy looking vehicle for the next oh, so many years. May Allah Almighty grant us contentment. Do not be, listen very carefully, do not be ashamed to live or to downgrade your life to the position that Allah has kept it. He will give you an upgrade very soon. You cannot start flying first class and it's your first time flying in a plane. No chance. You will, not, you will start with economy. In fact, you start going by bus. Then you go by train. Then you go by plane. Then you might be upgraded to business class. First, you don't buy. What happens? You earn miles and you are smart enough to just upgrade. That's it. Unless really you are, you are a, a very important person who requires that peace of mind and so on. It's a different story. But... After that, what happens? Allah upgrades you to a private jet. Those Gulf streams you are thinking about, they are close at reach. Inshallah, they are coming. Inshallah. I didn't hear anyone saying Amin. Hey, Mashallah, that was good. You know why? If you say Amin, let me tell you, it might be out of your reach. But Inshallah, Allah will give you something else. We will fly to Jannah, Inshallah. What do you say? But my brothers and sisters, Allah says Allah will extinguish riba, that which is unethical in business. He will cause it to be destroyed. Wayurbi, and he will cause growth for what? As sadaqat. He didn't say business. He said, he, look how Allah words it. Allah says, I will destroy interest and usury and I will cause to grow the charities. Allahu Akbar. Where do you talk about business, Ya Allah? You didn't. The business is the charity. When you want to earn, you need to bear in mind, Oh Allah, give me barakah so that I can give my two and a half percent and more. Allah says, we will bless you with a ton. Give, we will give you. Anfiq ya ibn Adama unfiq alayk. One of my favorite narrations of Hadith Qudsi. Spend, O oh son of Adam, I will spend on you. Give, I will give you. Give, I will give you. See, wallahi, I tell you in my life, and I'm sure many of you, I gave a bottle of perfume, I got two. I gave something, I got this. So much so that when I want something, I give. Wallahi, I'm serious. When I want something, I give. 
And that's why the hadith says the best charity you can ever give is that which you are giving someone in need. When you yourself are in need, you are fearing poverty and yet you are giving. Allah says, I watched it, I saw it. Don't worry, O son of Adam, if your intention was right, everything was good. Wait and see what we do for you. May Allah bless us. This is business. This is the real deal. Be straightforward. Be ethical. Be filled with the highest of morals and values when you are dealing. It might cause you discomfort a little bit because there is a trend around us of just making money by hook or crook. We will neither be crooks nor will we use hooks. We are going to deal in the name of Allah. رحم الله مريء سمحا إذا باع سمحا إذا اشترى الله has mercy upon a man or a person male or female but Allah has mercy on a person who is conscious considerate of the buyer when selling and considerate of the seller when buying I have a good deal you went you are happy I went I'm happy not that I squeeze you and squeeze you and squeeze you do you know to give someone profit is also an ibadah Say a man comes to you selling something and you are relatively wealthy and he says, look, I'm selling this at a thousand naira each. And you tell him, what is your cost? Wallahi, in Islam, you don't need to ask what is your cost. He doesn't need to tell you. He's not obliged to let you know. Because if he lets you know, you might be shocked. It could have just been 50 nairas. You see? But in essence, if a man comes to you and tells you, look, I'm selling this at a thousand, it's good to, to haggle. Haggling is good. You say, no, give us at 900. If he says, no problem, I give you at 900, you say, you, you came down so quickly, so now you go to 800. Well, if I knew that was the case, I would have told you, no, 999. You see, when I go back at home, when we go to purchase some stuff, you, and you, uh, we know the market value of certain things, like sometimes we purchase some cows and so on from the villages. And you ask him, how much is this? He looks at you, looks at your car, he looks at it, and he says, ah, come on. He looks at everything, then he says, $1,000. So now you look at him and say, I'll pay you 200. What? 200? No, just give me 300. It's okay. So you know how to deal. So dealing is a good thing. But you deal in a way that neither are you ripping someone nor are you squeezing them. You are happy. My deal was, it was okay. It was a good deal. I gave him a bit. You know why? He has a family. He has, he has children. He needs to feed. He has parents. He has commitments. He needs to bring for his house. At least I gave him a deal. When you can think of that in when you, while you are dealing more than only yourself, then you are a true believer. Then you are a true believer. We had a good deal. What happened? I, I gave, he gave. Inshallah, he will go home. He'll buy food for his family. He'll be a happy man. There goes. A shrewd businessman. We say this man is very shrewd. What is it? In Islam, the goodness of a businessman or a businesswoman is when they are considerate, they are sharp, they know their duty to Allah, they know how to deal in the world, and they know yawmun laka wa yawmun alayk. A day will be for you and a day against you. The day I lose, I thank Allah. The day I win, I thank Allah. Both of those days I am humble because I know when I have gotten something, Allah can take it away now. And when I have nothing, I know Allah can give me right now. That is my relation with Allah. Ultimately, we spoke about the one brother mentioned the grave. And he said, I, when you look at that grave, it's very humbling. Because why? We might be living in castles and palaces, but that grave is so narrow and small. Wallahi, it is an honor to go into the grave if you have prepared a little bit. How? Give out charities. Be humble. Give out. Look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, what they gave, what they said, what they, how they operated. Some of them were so wealthy, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhum, and look at the Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. These were wealthy people and mashallah, did they ever deal in a wrong way? No, they didn't. And every time something was asked of them, they gave. So Allah says, while Allah extinguishes haram, he causes growth of sadaqat. You give, Allah will cause that to grow. In what way? Number one, when you give a charity, Allah extinguishes the calamity from your life. Did you ever know that? It's a hadith. When, before we go on a journey, some of the elders from Katsina and Kano and here and there, they will teach you, just give a little charity. You are going. Where are you going? You are going to Abuja. You are driving. Give a small charity before you go. Have you heard that happening? Thank you. Why? It is based on a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which says, a sadaqa ul bala. Your charity will extinguish some calamity that might be in your direction. Instead of a major car accident, you had a little puncture and you stopped on the road. That's it. A few minutes and you were gone. What happened? 
Wallahi, because of the charity, by virtue of that, that calamity and disaster was extinguished from this to this. Very small. That's why we are taught as mu'mineen, when something strikes you, first things first, thank Allah, it could have been worse. That is a basic teaching of the mu'min. Everything that strikes you, you must say, this could have been worse. It's the only way that you are going to be able to carry through that particular calamity. You lost a leg. Ya Allah, I thank you. I could have lost two legs. At least I have one. It's hard. It's very hard. But you are a believer. You need to go through that. You will lose one day. You lose something. No, it's okay. Oh Allah, you took this away from me. My loved one, my child, my, uh, my uh, spouse, my parent. You took them away. They passed on. I thank you that at least there are others alive that I can call my family. Because there are people around. Right now, there was an earthquake in Morocco. And there were floods in Libya. Do you know families, communities wiped out in totality? May Allah bless them. May Allah make it easy for them. There is a school teacher who says she came back. She had gone out to the capital. By the time she came back, there was nothing remaining. All her students and everything gone. And she was the only one who lived. Read the story. It's in the news. Imagine. Like, I am sitting and thinking of business. We are talking about business. How many businesses were wiped out in the 10 seconds of that earthquake? If Allah did it there, do you not think he can do it here? Therefore, thank Allah and use what you have while you can use it. Because a day will come when it might just be taken away. May Allah Almighty grant us goodness. Then I want to teach you something else. Today we are sitting and talking about business. I spoke to brother Shuraim and I told him, listen, my brother. I want a committee to be created from this particular summit whereby you will empower young people who know nothing about a company to register a company on their names. And you make sure that they are taught how to trade. And then you have 117 and others who can come in and who can perhaps finance the good proposals that they have. Like they say, you make a proposal, make a plan, do something, learn. If our youngsters remain in their comfort zone, they are not going to grow. We need to take them out by showing a concern. It is only if you as a believer empower others that you can gauge your own success. You are not successful if you alone enjoyed yourself. It's not part of Allah's plan. Part of Allah's plan is how many have you empowered? Look at the Quran. Allah Almighty has revealed his kalam, the best and greatest word ever. He did not say the best of you are those who recite well. He did not say the best of you are those who know how to read Quran and understand it well. He said the best of you are those who learn it and teach it. Thank you very much. Without the teaching part of it, there is no best of you. What's the point of me being the top man? And I have never ever empowered anyone. I must sit here and create a committee to say, anyone here, come, let's talk about what is a business. Do you have a company registered on your name, my beloved children? When I say children, I'm talking of those in their late teens, perhaps in their early 20s, mid 20s. No, I don't. Why not? Have you ever thought of it? Why? We will help you. This is how you do it. It's done by ABC. There we are. What did we do? We kick-started something. Wallahi, if we have registered a thousand businesses, if 10% of them are successful, you have, you have actually empowered the ummah. But the problem with us, yes, we are successful and we think about growing more and more and more. Alhamdulillah, there are a lot of from amongst us who are doing good work. I'm not talking, I'm not saying everyone is like this, but today we are being critical. That's why I'm just trying to, to you know, juggle the mind a little bit. Sometimes we are so engrossed in earning and earning more and we want more and more that we forget that, listen, part of your, you know, the West calls it your social responsibility. Islam has it from the very beginning. It's your duty. Empower others. Bring them up. Be happy. None of you are true believers until you love for others what you love for yourself. Listen, my brother, come. You see, I tell you, countries are different. I'm not too sure about here, but perhaps I can guess based on my interactions. Let me tell you, in some countries, if you have a business and a man opens a similar business opposite the road, they will get very angry, very upset. If you have a big supermarket, a guy selling in a tuck shop across the road, you are intimidated by him. Why? This tuck shop is going to mess my price of cooking oil in here. Yeah, go to him, clean him, threaten him, do whatever. My brother, come to see the true mu'minin. When they have one shop where they sell mobile phones, the whole mall is only a mobile phone mall. When they have one shop that is selling hijabs, go and see in Makkah and Medina. 
The whole market is full of a hijab market. Go and check. Why? The risk is on Allah. I remember when I was a student, I used to help out volunteering. One of my friends, he used to have a hijab shop. And one day someone walked in and it was in the morning and we were during that. It was, you know, Ramadan, but there is a time of the day in the morning when things are empty. They struck a deal for, for, for a very expensive, elegant abaya with the owner. And he said, look, I have it. And then he made a phone call on the side. And he says, he spoke about something, something to someone. And he put the phone down and he told the lady, I have the stock. Everything is okay. But I want you to collect it from my friend across the road. And he pointed, he pointed there. And so she said, okay, let me go. So she went and whatever. I, I told him, why? What happened? He said, you know what? So many people came to me from the morning. No one came to him. He has the same thing I have. Let me just send him at least. You know, in Arabic, they use, they use the word nastaftih. That means, you know, let them open the day with some form of a deal. At least he can have his deal. It will open the day. May Allah bless you. I was given 30 minutes. I'm speaking 31 minutes and 48 seconds. Look at the inflation in Nigeria. So, inshallah, what is the rate of the Naira today, Sheikh? So that we know how many minutes to add here. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. I know we, we appreciate those light-hearted moments. Inshallah, I'll round up just now. But the idea is to empower others to think about them, to worry about the future. If I may go, alhamdulillah, I had and I have and I will still have. People will really appreciate you. They will pray for you. One prayer after your death by someone who sincerely was Touched by you is more valuable than your entire estate put together. One dua can get you into paradise. So let's add, while, while we all need the money, while we all have to go out and earn, while there is a naturally inclined, a, a natural inclination towards wealth and good things and nice things, it's not haram. And while we are trying to get all of that, don't forget your main focus is to please Allah. Your main focus is to Look at everyone else and tell yourself these people are the creatures of the same Allah whom I love and whom I want to love me. If I want him to love me and I love him truly, I will try to be very nice and kind to all these people I see, including those walking on the street. And this is why one thing, and I'll end on this note because it's come to my mind and there's so much that comes when we talk about business, even though... I'm not such a wealthy man, but inshallah, we have Quran and Sunnah. What else? Allah says when he describes the successful and the people of paradise and who they were, you know what he says? Those people in their wealth, they kept a portion for the beggars and those who don't have. Today, when a beggar comes to you and asks you, anyway, on the streets, we, while we are balancing on a tightrope because we don't want to encourage it and at the same time we want to be good Muslims. It's very tricky because you see someone begging and you are torn between giving and, and not encouraging. I, it happens to me. I, I, we stop at a traffic light, I see someone, I really, you know, I try to focus on the road but sometimes you can't help it. You are so torn. Can I give or what do I do? Should I say, hey, this looks like a needy cause and then they told me it's a big syndicate. These people are richer than you. They are driving Bentleys and Rolls Royces. But you don't know what's the truth. And then you are thinking to yourself, Ilah al I'm just going to judge based on the re what I see. Forgive me. Allah will take it. But we have a problem because there are others that you encouraging it. You, why are you giving? Why are you encouraging? Anyway, to cut a long story short, the Quran tells you about the beggar. In a few verses, one of them is the people whom Allah has blessed and who, whom Allah will grant Jannah, they are the ones whom in their wealth, they had a portion for beggars. A sail means someone who comes to ask, not necessarily like this on a street, but anyone who says, look, I'm in need, I really need. You don't have to give all of them, but you must have a portion that you give. You must assist. Secondly, those who don't have, you also have a portion for them. They may not ask you, but you have a portion for them. I'm going to be generous. Small. The portion depends on how much you have originally, what you have. And thereafter, my beloved brothers and sisters, you've got to go back to the Quran, looking at the term Sail and the beggar, where Allah speaks in a most powerful way. In Surah al duha He speaks of his favors upon Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and upon all of us. And then he gives us guidance and advice. And he tells us regarding the beggar, Regarding the beggar, he created the beggar in the sense that he created the need there. If Allah wanted, he didn't need to have a single beggar, not a single beggar. 
they, they would have been met, their needs would have been met by Allah yeah. completely. Yes. Oh. Welcome to Nigeria, my brothers and sisters. It happens to me also wherever we go, but it's nice, mashallah. It means uh, time is up. Yes, one more point. So, Allah says, as for the beggar, he didn't say give him. Because why? There are different types of beggars, isn't it? Some might be genuine, not genuine. Allah says, as for the beggar, offer him some respect. That's all. What do you do? Don't rebuke him. Don't abuse him. Don't insult him at all. You don't know the reality of who, what, where, and when. So if someone comes now going back to the same street where people come to all of us on our roads and they stop us and they knock on the window and they do the... Allah tells you, never mind about giving, that's something else. At least minimum to offer them. Don't abuse them. Don't insult them. Don't swear them. Don't mock at them. Allah says, don't disrespect someone who's asking and begging. That's all Allah is asking. What an amazing piece of advice. Imagine if Allah told you, as for the beggar, give him. By now, the beggars would all be scattered around our areas. They would know the Muslims, they're going to give. And it happens. You know, if you look at the wealth we have, it may not be as much as other communities and societies. But Alhamdulillah, I am always happy to note that the charities that the Muslims give, we are by far the most charitable ummah that exists on earth today. So thank Allah for that. And may Allah Almighty accept it from us. And may Allah grant us goodness, all of us. May Allah give us barakah in our wealth. May Allah give us wealth and barakah with it. And don't forget the dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa qina adhab al nar. I met a young boy who told me, am I allowed to repeat the first part of it three times? I said, for what? It's a bid'ah. He said, but I need more of the dunya. I said, no, no, no. Atina fi dunya hasana, dunya hasana, dunya wa fil akhirati. He said, no, in fact, you should be making it three times more there. It's a bid'ah. You shouldn't do that. You should make that dua as easy. It's a verse of the Quran. You can't, just, you can't just repeat one part of it three times and the others one one. What are you trying to prove? May Allah grant us goodness. But that's the nature of man. May Allah Almighty bless us with good ethics. I really look forward to some beautiful conclusions and beautiful resolutions coming out from this summit whereby we can empower those who are not empowered and who haven't even thought about empowerment 